I have this memory from when I was a kid, maybe 10 or 11 years old. My bedroom in our house was in the basement, and there were no windows to the outside in this bedroom. It's what you would call non-conforming nowadays. And if the lights were off outside of the room in the basement, there would be no light underneath the door. There would be no ambient light anywhere. It would be pitch black. You wouldn't be able to see anything. And I remember one morning I woke up still early. The lights were off outside. The lights were off inside. And I got out of bed in order to walk out of my bedroom, to walk to the door. And I ended up in the closet. I literally got lost in my own bedroom. Now, you could understand, as funny as that is, you can understand why that happened. If there's, if there's no light, no idea where to go, where things are, it's difficult to navigate. In fact, light is really important for that, isn't it? If you want to go anywhere, you need light. You need to be able to see. You need to know where things are. I find that that is a, a pretty good analogy for living in the darkness of sin. And it's an analogy that I've used with my catechism students. It always seems to resonate with them. Try to imagine that you are in a dark room. It's pitch black. You can't make out shapes or objects or anything. There's no ambient light. Your eyes will never adjust. And you're trying to find your way. You're in this dark room, but you don't know where anything is. You don't know how far away objects are from you or from each other. And so you don't know where to go. You might start wandering around, but instead of finding the door you might end up in the closet. And in this analogy, to make matters even worse, let's say my my bedroom as a kid in the closet, that's where my parents decided to keep their razor wire and hazardous materials. I don't know why they would do that, but there it is. How dangerous that would be. Not Not only do you not know where to go, if you do take a step, if you do try to wander around, you risk injuring yourself, you risk killing yourself. That is the darkness of unbelief. As we live without faith in Christ, we know that we need to find him, but we have no idea how to get there. We have no idea where he is. And in fact, in this dark room of unbelief, we don't even know if he exists. And instead, we wander around, groping around, trying to find some light, but what we do is we stumble upon the dangerous objects that are in front of us, sin, Sin that condemns, sin that destroys, sin that ruins us. No matter where we go, there it is. Like razor wire and hazardous waste. So what do we do? Stand still, I suppose, but to stand still, to do nothing, that too would only lead to death. The darkness of sin is dangerous. It leads to death. And this is what the Apostle John is saying to us, writing to us in his first letter. At the very end of our sermon text, we hear him say these words. He does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. That's the condition of the unbeliever. In fact, that is our natural state. That is how we come into the world, completely blind in darkness. And there's no solution that we can find on our own. But there is a solution. And the Apostle John even tells us what that is. Now, as John writes these words, his main point, at least in this particular portion of his letter, is not not necessarily to point out Christ and the light that he gives, but, but he does mention it. He does tell us what that solution is. In our text, John writes, The darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. And we can say that that is a clear reference to Christ because John has already written something similar in Scripture. Maybe you remember hearing it on Christmas Day when John wrote this. In him, that is Jesus, was life. And that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. What Christ has done is come into our lives through word and sacrament and he's turned on the light. He's turned on the light in this dark room of unbelief. You flip the light switch and just like that, all of a sudden, we can see. And all of a sudden, we see our sin and that would be terrifying, but as soon as that light comes on, as soon as we see Christ, we see Jesus coming in, snatching up all of that sin and making it his own so that he can deal with it. And the sin that is all around us, the temptation that would lead us to ruin and destruction And all those dark things that that would 
endanger us, threaten us, and destroy us. Condemnation, punishment. We see Jesus in this light, taking all those things upon himself and undergoing all of that in our place. So that the danger of sin, the condemnation that comes as a result of sin, the ruin and destruction that we should receive, we see all of it landing on Christ. And all of that, in that flash of light, Jesus flips the light switch on so that we can see where we are and we can see our salvation. That's the light. And in that light is the life of men. In that light is eternal life for all of us. And how good does it feel to live in the light? How joyful we are when we know that all the things that we have done wrong, Christ has made himself responsible for it. How overjoyed we become when we see Jesus taking all of our sin and saying, I'll handle it. How filled with gratitude we must be when Jesus endures all of the pain and the punishment that should have been ours. All of that is for our good. How wonderful it is to live in the light. Which is what the prophet Isaiah was talking about. In that portion of scripture that we heard earlier today, he says, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. And on those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. These were people who were living in the darkness of their sin and unbelief, and they were terrified. And they had no hope. They were alone. Anyone living in the darkness of unbelief is going to be terrified without hope and alone. As I said, that's our natural condition. That's the way that we come into the world. We are in the darkness of unbelief, and so all we see around us is the blackness of our sin. All we see are our sinful actions by which we serve only ourselves. The deeds that we do that have no concern for others, certainly no concern for God. Because in this darkness of unbelief, we see ourselves as the ones to serve, the ones who are most important. And we make that claim, and through our words and actions, we tell others, I'm the most important. So my resources, my time, my efforts, those all belong to me. How dare you expect to receive anything from me? How dare you expect to receive some of my time, or some of my attention? No, it should go the other way around. And if you imagine every individual in the world thinking that way, it should be the other way around. You are here to serve me. It would never happen. And we would continue to walk in that, that darkness and that unbelief. And God would be an afterthought. Spend my time worshiping him? I've got more important things to do. We look around, that's all we see. And if we listen, all we hear are the words that we speak, the words that alienate ourselves from God and from each other. Words, once again, claiming our own self-importance. Louder than the rest, so that everybody can know we are the ones they need to listen to. they got to do what we say, and they have to think the way that we think. And that's the way it should be. But all of this makes us guilty. The darkness of sin and unbelief makes us objects of God's wrath. What a terrifying way to live. How alone we would feel. How hopeless things would be for us. But Isaiah said, the light is shining. The light is coming to us. Christ comes into the world and he says to us, you are not alone. You have no reason to be afraid. Let me fill you with hope. That's the great light that we see. Jesus Christ, who made himself a sacrifice for our sins, who took on the guilt, took on the responsibility that, that we owed. This is the light that comes into our lives. We know that we have eternal life because of him. Not because of ourselves. When we look at ourselves, all we see is sin. But when we look at him, all we have is hope and peace. This is what it means to live in the light of God's grace. But in this letter that John writes to his readers, he shows us that there's something else, 
something that goes with it, something else that goes hand in hand with living in the light of God's grace. Now, as you read through this portion of John's letter, and, and maybe if you read through the entire letter, it might be a little difficult to follow John's train of thought. He kind of jumps around from one thing to the next. If you were to, to sit there and give it some time and, and really concentrate and dig, you'd get it. You would. It wouldn't be a problem. But reading through it or hearing me read through it one time might be difficult. So let me, let me zero in on a few phrases that help us understand John's point. Because what we're talking about here is not only being in God's grace and being in that light, but, but doing in that light. The two go hand in hand. We're talking about being a child of God and then living as a child of God, walking in the light of God's grace. John says, But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. The obedience to God's word and God's love being in the believer, those two things go together. They go hand in hand. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. So to live in Christ and to say, I live in Christ, well, it carries with it the idea of of doing, acting, Service to God and to others. But he says, whoever loves his brother lives in the light, and there is nothing in him to make him stumble. To love one another is what we do when we live in the light of faith and walk in the light of God's grace. Or John states it another way, kind of the opposite of it. He says, anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in the darkness. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. When I was a kid, my bedroom was in the basement and it was pitch black. There were no lights on anywhere. I couldn't see anything. If only I'd had a a lamp on my nightstand. And if I had, I would have turned it on and one singular light bulb would have been enough to illuminate the room and I wouldn't have ended up in the closet. The light wasn't on. I didn't have a lamp. I ended up in the closet. And that's kind of funny, but still understandable. But what if I had turned that light on? And instead of walking to the door out my bedroom, I decided to walk into that closet filled with razor wire and hazardous waste all the same. Or what if I turned the light on and then decided to shut my eyes tight and just wander around, stumbling and bumping into things and potentially hurting myself? You would say, that's not funny. And it's not understandable. It's sad and tragic. We have the light of Christ. Christ has come to us and not only has he illuminated our sins, made us aware of them, he has also illuminated the solution to that problem. He has taken those sins away from us. How would it be then if we were to squeeze our eyes tightly shut and stumble around in darkness once again, tripping and stumbling over sin that hurts us and tears us away from God? Or how would it be if we were in the light, we can see everything, and instead of following Christ, obedience to him and his word, we dive headlong into the sinful desires that we have, the temptations, things that we want in our lives that make us feel good, but again, destroy us because they tear us away from God. Who would do that? Maybe you're thinking to yourself at this moment, as I am, well, pastor, I would do that. Because I've done it. We live in the light. And yet we also live with the sinful nature that constantly wants us to close our eyes, to turn off the light, and forget about Christ. And it's a struggle each and every day. Dear Christian friends, remember this. You are indeed in the light. And it's not because you have done anything. It's not because you have decided to open your eyes. It's because God has declared it to you. He brought you to faith. Through word and sacrament, he brought you into the light, and that light continues to shine. That's his promise to you. And that promise is especially comforting and especially powerful when we know we have failed, when we know that we have closed our eyes and done things that were unloving and selfish and arrogant and prideful. It's comforting because we can always look to Christ And know that no matter what we have done, no matter how great our sin, 
Christ's light shines on us and we see that sin being taken from us and being placed on himself. And that's something that God will never let us lose or forget about. God's promise to us, his grace to us, is that we will be his children. He will keep us close to him so that we continue to walk in the light. And as he does that, he empowers us. Through grace, through faith, he empowers us and equips us to continue to walk as Christ would have us walk, in love for one another and in love for God. This is what it means to walk in the light of God's grace. To live as we are. His children, his his followers, those who say, I know him. And I know what he has done. Let us continue to walk in that light. Because God has promised. He sent his son into the world to live for us. He sent his son into the world to die for us. He sent his son in the world to rise again. He gives us the hope of eternal life. And so as we live our lives, living in the light of God's grace, may we continue to walk in that grace. Acting, doing, as God leads. This is our prayer each and every day. May God grant this grace to us to know him and to live for him each day. Amen. Please stand. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.